In addition to the Government of Canada and the provincial and territorial governments, there are thousands of other governments all across Canada known as local governments. Local governments include municipal governments, which govern over cities, towns, or villages, as well as specialized governing bodies, like school boards, health commissions, and conservation authorities. Many of Canada's municipalities date back to before Confederation in 1867. To many people, local government is misunderstood and taken for granted. Yet, it is the one form of government that affects our day-to-day -day lives so constantly. Imagine not having clean drinking water or safe roads to get to school or work, or not having someone to take your garbage away. The Canadian Constitution, which is the highest law in the country, divides governing authority between the federal government and the provincial governments. The federal government has jurisdiction over issues that affect Canada as a whole, things like national defense and the post office. Provincial and territorial governments have jurisdiction over things that are more regionally specific, things like natural resources and social services. The Constitution does not directly give power to local governments, but instead gives provinces the power to create these governments. So, the authority of municipal governments and other governing bodies is authority that has been granted by the province. Each province has legislation regarding the powers, responsibilities, and organization of municipalities. Things municipalities provide include clean water, sewage control, public transit, library services, police services, child care, animal control, bylaw enforcement, ambulance services, roads and sidewalks, social services, garbage collection, and recycling, just to name a few. Most of the money used to provide these services comes from property taxes and grants from the provincial or territorial government. Depending mostly on its size and population, a municipality may be classified as a city, town, village, rural municipality, district, region, or community. The usage of these terms will vary from province to province or territory. For example, in British Columbia, they have cities, towns, villages, district municipalities, and regional districts. In Prince Edward Island, they have cities, towns, and communities. Regions, counties, and districts are usually located rurally. Towns and cities, on the other hand, are usually economic centers with a concentrated population. Often, county, regional, or district areas may encompass other municipalities. In Ontario, for example, the regional government is, in fact, a federation of the towns and cities within it. This is referred to as a two-tier system. If you lived in Oakville, you would have two municipal governments, the town of Oakville, the lower tier, and the regional municipality of Halton, the upper tier. Each has different responsibilities. The reason for two-tier government is that it's believed to be more efficient when the responsibility of providing certain services is shared amongst neighboring municipalities. Municipal governments are composed of elected councillors and their staff. We'll talk more about municipal governments in a moment, but first, let's turn back to the other type of local governments we mentioned. These special purpose bodies operate at the local level, but are outside the normal structure of the municipality and have a certain degree of independence. Because they are usually called agencies, boards, or commissions, they are sometimes referred to as the ABCs. 
School boards, or boards of education, are the most commonly known type of these specialized local governing bodies. School boards oversee the operation of the local schooling system and have officials called trustees, who are usually elected. School board staff will include teachers and principals as well as other non-teaching personnel. Their main responsibilities are hiring teachers, maintaining facilities and providing supplies. Other agencies, boards or commissions that fall into this category include police boards, utility commissions and conservation authorities. Local governments include municipal governments, as well as specialized governing bodies, usually called agencies, boards, or commissions. The authority of municipal governments and other governing bodies like school boards is authority that has been granted by the province. Local governments provide services to citizens using money from property taxes, user fees, and provincial grants. A municipality may be classified as a city, town, village, rural or district or regional municipality or community. Often county, regional or district areas may encompass other municipalities, creating two levels of local government. This is called a two-tier system. Municipal governments are composed of elected councillors and other staff. Let's take a closer look at the organization of municipal governments. At the heart of municipal government is council. Council members are elected. The municipal council sets policy and passes bylaws. Working with council are committees. Committees are groups that specialize in a certain area in order to help council oversee different departments. Under the supervision of the council and its committees are the various departments and the countless staff who administer services. Departments that administer services may include the police department, the roads department, or the planning department. Councillors are elected to council in municipal elections at large or by ward. By ward means the municipality is divided up into sections called wards. The citizens of each ward elect their own councillor and so each ward has a representative on council. Election at large simply means that the municipality is not divided up and councillors are elected by voters from across the entire municipality. The head of council is called the mayor, reeve, warden, or district chair. Council heads may be elected to the position, or else councillors appoint one of themselves to the position. In a two-tier system, the upper tier is a federation of the lower tier municipalities. So the upper tier council is usually comprised of all the lower tier councillors, or just the heads. Unlike provincial or federal politics, the party system doesn't play much of a role in municipal politics. There are a few exceptions, however. Vancouver, for example, has seen political parties at the city level for decades. One of the major responsibilities of municipal government is to collect revenue through taxation and use it on services. Most of a city's money comes from collecting property tax. Each year, property owners must pay to the city an amount directly related to the value of the property they own. Other sources of revenue are user fees, such as bus fares, parking fees, and fines from parking tickets. Municipalities also receive money from the provinces in the form of grants. However, much of the money received in the form of provincial grants comes with conditions. That is, the money will only be given to the municipality on the condition that it is spent in a certain way. Huh? At, the 
At the heart of municipal government is council. As we mentioned, these elected representatives, called councillors or aldermen, have the authority to set policy and pass bylaws. A bylaw is a rule that citizens must obey, like, you can't park here overnight, or you need to clean up after your dog. Depending on the size of the municipality, a council may have as few as three members or as many as 50 or more. The TTC budget, the extra $2 million, yes, was recommended and approved for 2006. In addition to passing specific bylaws, council sets general policy and oversees the operation of the different government departments. Certainly, uh, this mayor and council should be very, very proud of the fact that uh, the Leinster Court project will probably be moving ahead within the next month. Whether it's the decision to allow for the construction of a large retail outlet in the downtown core, or to install a stop sign at a quiet intersection, municipal councillors make decisions that affect everyone. Many of the decisions that face council require a great deal of expertise, expertise that councillors themselves do not always have. For example, not every councillor may know how the construction of a large retail outlet in the downtown core will increase traffic volume, or affect emergency service responsiveness, or affect property values nearby. This is why committees are so important. Committees are groups that specialize in certain issues or within a certain service area. Standing committees are permanent committees associated with ongoing operations, like road maintenance or garbage collection. These committees provide the expertise necessary for council to oversee the operation of the main government departments. Other committees may be formed for a temporary basis. These are committees that will be dissolved when the issue is resolved or the project is finished. Let's take our hypothetical question of whether or not to allow a large retailer to build a store in the downtown core. A temporary committee formed to investigate the issue might include one or more councillors, an engineer from the city staff whose area of expertise is roads and traffic, and another engineer whose area is site development and rezoning. The committee will consult with other city planners and members of the community here are some ways it might undertake these consultations. It might conduct an opinion poll among local residents to learn how they feel about it. It might do a study on the impact that a similar project had in a city nearby. It might hear delegates from the community or a local environmentalist who wants to protect the creek that runs through the property in question. By doing these things, the committee acquires the proper expertise so that it can report to council with recommendations. Council can then make informed decisions and direct their staff accordingly. Committees are important components of government organizations. The day-to-day -day operation and dispensing of city services lies with the administrative and staff portions of the government. These are the people working behind the scenes at City Hall, like secretaries, clerks, and engineers, as well as those working in the community and on the streets getting things done, from police and rescue workers right down to the summer student who waters the flower beds in the city parks. We have learned that the basic structure of municipal government is based on the council system, Council sets policy and administration gets things done. Acting as a go-between between these two parts are various committees. It is useful to think of this structure in terms of the political and the executive. Council is the political component. These are the people most visible to the public. They run for election and try to be responsive to the needs of ordinary citizens. They discuss the issues and, as councillors, possess the authority to set policy and pass bylaws. Their role is very political. The administration and all the staff is the executive. They execute the wishes of council. 
They possess the practical expertise needed to conduct the day-to-day -day operations of the city and get the job done. To further illustrate the distinction between these two roles, take for example the issue of a city park. Essentially, it will be the job of the political part, that is, city council, to approve the initial decisions about the park, where it will be located, if it will include a playground or a soccer field, how much money will be allocated to its construction, and even what the name of the park will be. These decisions will be ratified in council sessions. It is then the role of the executive portion, that is the administration, to carry out or execute these plans. The Parks Department will supervise crews of city workers who landscape the park, plant trees, install benches, build a children's playground, and pave a parking lot. Many towns and cities across Canada have adopted variations in their municipal government structures, usually with the intention of giving administrators more autonomy and control, or just the opposite, making city administrators more accountable to council, thereby giving council more control. Let's take a closer look at four different organizational models that are commonly used. We'll start with two models that provide more power to the political level, Board of Control, and Council Executive Committee. The Board of Control model was adopted by Toronto in the 1890s and was for many years a mandatory structure in Ontario for municipalities with populations exceeding 100,000. With this system, there are regular councillors, usually elected by ward, and in addition, there are controllers who are elected at large from the entire municipality. Controllers sit on the council, but they also have direct control over a specific department. The controllers form the Board of Control. A Board of Control is like the provincial or federal cabinets, where a small group from within the elected legislature forms an executive committee to directly oversee government departments. Because this special group of councillors directly oversees each municipal department, with the Board of Control system, there is an emphasis on power at the political level. Council Executive Committee The Council Executive Committee system is similar to the Board of Control system in that there is one central executive committee that oversees each specific committee and department. However, while council members are elected, Executive Committee members are appointed by Council. The only elected member of the Executive Council is the Mayor, who heads it. For the most part, Council Executive Committees are comprised of the heads of each of the lower committees, which in turn oversee each department. Council Executive Committees have long existed in Quebec City and Montreal. Like the Board of Control, the Council Executive Committee system places more responsibility at the political level. The following council models are designed to do the opposite, place more responsibility at the administrative level. These are the Council Chief Administrative Officer system and the Board of Commissioners system. The Council Chief Administrative Officer system is a simple and streamlined approach to administration. One individual, the Council Chief Administrative Officer, oversees all the departments. They may also be known as the City Administrator, the Municipal Manager, the City Commissioner, or the CAO for Chief Administrative Officer. The CAO is appointed by Council and is accountable to Council, but essentially heads the entire administration. Each Municipal Department reports directly to him or her, and committees have less importance. Because one single person is overseeing all departments, coordination and cooperation among departments is easier. Compared to the two previous models, the Council Chief Administrative Officer system shifts decision-making power towards the executive level. The Board of Commissioners system evolved in Western Canadian cities such as Edmonton, Winnipeg and Calgary. 
It is similar to the Council Chief Administrative Officer system, except instead of one appointed administrator, there are three or four called commissioners. Each commissioner oversees a set of departments according to his or her area of expertise. The commissioners comprise the Board of Commissioners and are collectively responsible to a single Chief Administrative Officer or else directly to Council. This system spreads out the responsibilities, allowing for more specialized expertise at the head of each department, as compared with one single administrator, like in the previous model. Let's recap. Here, we see the basic council system, and then each of these four variations applied. The Board of Control model, the Council Executive Committee system, Council Chief Administrative Officer system, and the Board of Commissioners system. As we mentioned, the powers that municipal governments exercise are powers that have been granted to them by their provincial or territorial government. As such, municipalities are limited in their autonomy and there are many ways in which provincial governments exert influence over municipal affairs. For example, many bylaws passed by a municipality require provincial approval. And planning decisions, like a city's decision to rezone an area for commercial development, can be overruled by the province. Furthermore, a great deal of the funding that municipalities receive from the province is conditional, meaning it must be spent how the province sees fit. In fact, the powers and responsibilities of a municipality can be changed any time by the provincial government with a majority vote in the provincial legislature. In the past two decades, the general trend has been the downloading of responsibilities from the province to the municipality, providing more flexibility for municipalities to deliver services in a way they see fit. The province is happy to be relieved of certain burdens, and municipalities welcome the increased freedom to implement their own methods. However, shifting responsibilities from the province to the municipality naturally entails an increased financial burden for the municipality. In response, cities have demanded more funding from their provincial and territorial governments. As urban areas expand, the common trend in the last decade or more is for municipalities to go through a process of amalgamation. This is when a group of adjacent municipalities combine to form one large municipality. This is most common among large cities and their surrounding boroughs. For example, the city of Toronto combined with its surrounding municipalities in 1998 to form what has been dubbed the megacity. Examples of other cities that have been consolidated with other cities or with their surrounding areas include Hamilton, Winnipeg, Halifax, and Dartmouth. As a citizen, you have the right to be heard by your elected representatives. Municipalities generally have a policy of openness and accessibility for public participation and will allow any citizen to speak on matters of concern at committee or council meetings. If you have a concern that you think needs to be heard by your local government, contact your town hall to find out how to go about it. They can advise you on the appropriate individual or committee to hear your concerns and when you can do it. When presenting to a committee, be prepared. Write out what you want to say. They will probably allot you a maximum time of five minutes, and they may have questions. They will hear your concerns or suggestions and may pass them on to Council for consideration. Other ways ordinary citizens can get involved is by taking part in public consultations that municipalities conduct to hear concerns and suggestions about community affairs and provide information and answer questions. These are usually public meetings typically held at the local public school gymnasiums or recreation center. Some municipalities have committees made up entirely of citizens. Often these are volunteers with a certain special interest or expertise, community members who are sensitive to certain issues and can advise council on sensible policy. Mm. 
At the heart of municipal government is an elected council that sets policy and passes bylaws. Councillors are elected to council in municipal elections at large or by ward. Committees specialize in certain areas and help council run each department. The day-to-day -day operation and dispensing of city services lies with the administrative and staff portions of the government. This includes secretaries, clerks, engineers, police and rescue workers, and park landscapers. Council can be thought of as the political component, while the administration and staff is the executive. Different models of organization exist within the general council system framework. Models common to Canadian municipalities include the Board of Control System, the Council Executive Committee System, the Council Chief Administrative Officer System, and the Board of Commissioners System. Provincial and territorial governments can exert influence over municipal affairs by reserving the right to overrule major municipal planning decisions, by making grant money conditional, and by creating legislation that affects municipal powers. In the past two decades, the general trend has been the downloading of responsibilities from the province to the municipality, providing more flexibility for municipalities to deliver services in a way they see fit. Amalgamation is when a group of adjacent municipalities consolidate to form one large municipality. Municipalities generally have a policy of openness and accessibility for public participation. As a citizen, you have the right to be heard by your elected representatives. This concludes our program.